Before I start today, may I know how many of you have secrets? Please raise your hand if you have a secret. Okay, you are literally the most honest group of people I've ever known on Earth. <laughs> Now we have 600 really honest people in the room. Everybody has secrets. I'm a psychotherapist. Listening to people's secrets is part of my job. Sometimes, doing psychoanalytic work is as being an archaeologist in people's mind. And in this archaeology process, interestingly, we see how history create common memories in people's mind and create common secrets. These secrets are sometimes unspoken. And these unspoken secrets can have an impact on people on an individual level, in families, and of course, in societies. Today, I'm going to talk about secrets that has something to do with many of you here. Please raise your hand if you belong to the single child generation of China. Yes, a lot of people. I also belong to this group. Um, born in the 1980s, I have a tag on me on the moment I was born. We belong to the probably the first and most likely the last single child generation in human history. When I grew up, I married to another single child, had our first baby, and then the second. We no longer need to worry if it's legal or not. In 2015, China terminated 35 years of single-child policy and started to adopt the two-children policy instead. Now we can have two instead of one. Yet, in my personal experience, I still encountered some challenge. We almost had a natural miscarriage. It was only in the 17th week of my pregnancy, and the fetus was far from mature. When I was sent to the hospital in emergency, the doctor said, "Lie on the bed, waiting for it to come down." In huge pain, fear, and sorrow, I lied on the bed, praying that my journey with my second baby can continue. It was a happy ending story in the end. The next day, the baby is still alive inside my womb. And today he's almost four years old and is a happy little boy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But what really strikes me is not only these ups and downs I encounter during this process; it's also something that my mom murmured when she knew I can continue this journey with a second baby. She said, "I'm glad your daughter don't have to miss a brother like you have did." I was shocked. What did you just say? I had a brother. Did you just say I had a brother? And my mom said, "Yes. If I would have been captain, he wouldn't be in his thirty right now." My mom is one of the two hundred million women who had to give up having another second child in the thirty-five years of the policy. 200 million. That's almost two thirds of the population of United States. I never thought I was one of the children who actually lost a sibling in that historical trend. I also feel a little bit sad after I know this fact. Not only because I want to imagine a life with a brother. How can it be different? Well, it could be worse. But anyway. In my memory, I was usually given short hair and not given dresses to wear. In my childhood, I envy those girls who can always wear dresses and have long hair as they wish. I even thought I might be a victim of the favor boys to girls culture in China. What I didn't know is that it could be an unconscious choice of my parents to raise me up. In a child that they probably lost, to raise me up in a way so that they can remember. Sometimes my memory will also flash back to the night 
when I lie on that hospital bed. I kept thinking to myself, did my parents also experience these pains, fears, and guilt like I have did? Did they ever talk to someone about it? What if it was me being given up? Did I take the place of my brother? For some, these questions are not just questions. It could be more than that. When I work in the session rooms, I work with families, and I notice after 2015, the patients who were struggling whether to have a second baby increased sharply, partly because, for us, a blank memory is how to live up with a sibling. But for some people, it's more than that. One day, I was talking to a friend of mine. She was pregnant with a second baby, and she was experiencing more than the universal anxiety that you can imagine. She was having huge depression and anxiety after she got pregnant again, without any conscious reason she can think of. In our talk, I just randomly asked her a question. I said, do you have any memories relating to your mother's giving birth? Silence. A long, long silence. Then she started to sob. After a few minutes, she started to show me something that was probably too painful for her to remember. Being the first child in the family, she witnessed how her mother was unable to protect the second baby and herself many years ago. She witnessed how her mother was trapped and forced to have an abortion. She witnessed the tears and silence after everything was done. No one has ever talked to her about it. She told me, I never thought I would come back to these memories again as I become a mother of two children. Pregnant with another child means helplessness and danger in my mind. That is torturing. While abortion can be a taboo topic in many different cultures, in China, it is even more complicated. Abortion sometimes was not a choice, but a compliance. Although the single child policy might have a historical and economical background, for each individual who really sacrificed for this policy, the cost can be high. In a research published in 2006 showed that 50% of the women who went through an abortion may go through psychic symptoms such as fear, depression, shame, flashbacks, guilt, or even suicidal thoughts. Living in the only country in the world where female suicidal rates is higher than male, Chinese women have been told that we are half the sky for decades. But it is also in the same decades we were not even able to decide how much children we want. Is it possible that when it comes to the pregnancy issue, women are treated more like machines, not like a human with free will. Asking most of the Chinese single child generation of our childhood memory, we may come up with many lively things. We may come up with our uh, love or hates for our parents, our livelihoods in the schools, but barely we talk about or even notice the individual losses or sacrifice in the historical trend. Even we choose to ignore, to hide, to forget, to deny that sad things did not happen, something will stay us in a very subtle way. We call it an elephant in the room or scarred secrets. It changed our perceptions in parenting in many different ways. I'll give you an example. I guess some of you maybe know that in China, when you are pregnant with a second baby and you hold your elder daughter to the street, you, she may encounter some warning from people you don't even know, or someone who you just meet one year on the family table, once a year. 
They may come up by saying, "Be careful! When your mother have another baby, she will not like you anymore." Terrified. I don't take this as a curse or evil will of these people, but rather I believe they are speaking out something they really experienced in the past. Back to their times, starvation was usual, and one more child in the house probably means a lot of tension and neglect. They say it because they want people to get prepared for these heartbreaks. They say it because they want to tell people their wisdom to survive after these hard years. A mother with a baby in in the tummy and a child in hand may probably trigger their unconscious memory, and they probably want to escape. If they have never had the chance to go through these miseries with someone else again. It may turn out to be another layer of hurt to a new generation. When they say to the child, "Your mother may probably don't like you," it's creating another scar. That is how unconscious parenting affects us in an intergenerational way. Sometimes people grow up telling themselves, "I don't want to grow up like my parents," but at some point. They will discover they share something similar, like their parents. They grew up to be the parent they know. It's always easier to offer something we know than the unknown. But when people can see there are other options, new possibilities arise. When we can share these stories and secrets, understanding and forgiveness happen. I can offer you something in a totally different way. I don't have to repeat this past. It is a kind of freedom. While we can have two children right now, our memories, especially those scarred secrets of the single child generation, are quickly fading away. Going to a cinema or opening a TV in China, you barely see any mainstream media talking about the individual stories in these historical trends, especially those losses and sacrifices. People think abortion is just a small surgery. It was common. Anyone who has a relevant secret has nowhere to release it. In modern society. Of course, you can go to a psychotherapist to safely share these secrets, but not everyone is able to have a professional listener. If our society does not give an ear to the voices and stories of these people, they will be isolated in their memories forever. One TED speaker in United States called、um, Sebastian Junger. He used to say, "It is a lonely society that makes it hard to come home from war." Ignoring these feelings sometimes brings another layer of hurt to those people who really went through the tragedies. People in a group experience psychic stress, but people in isolation will experience even bigger stress. In 2005, a group of researchers have done a very interesting research. They have a group of lab rats being emotionally attacked by a larger rat. Afterwards, some lab rats, those who were kept in a group, recover within 48 hours, 48 hours without developing further psychic symptoms. But those lab rats who were not lucky enough to stay in a group, who were put in isolation, did not recover at all. Instead, they grow long-term psychic symptoms. If creatures cannot feel unified or being accompanied, it's very hard to integrate and to heal. Now that I feel more loving in sharing these scar secrets with my families, my friends, my patients, and of course this moment with all of you here, with my parents, 
I can understand and forgive their choice to raise me up in the shadow of a lost child. When I see my two children playing and fighting in front of me, I feel more able to treat them as who they are. With my friend, guess what happened? After I listened to her story, I gave her a hug and told her it was not her fault. She returned home, and the next day, she gave me a telephone call. She said, "Kate, you know what? I made a dream last night, and inside the dream, I saw a little girl. That's probably my lost little sister. In the dream, she smiled to me, hugged me, and waved goodbye." When I woke up from the dream, I have tears on my face, but I feel warm and fascinated. She then explained to herself it could be a farewell to the past and a blessing to the future. That is the power of sharing scarred secrets. When th these secrets are told, you are no longer alone. It doesn't hurt you that much. You don't have to be a lonely secret bearer. If we are able to talk to each other about these secrets, we feel more close to each other. Talk to your parents or grandparents about their stories and probably secrets in this history. Give them a hug. Tell them it was hard. Keep these stories in your mind, and that's all what it is about. No one should be forgotten or left alone in this history. When we see that this history brings us so much pain, we will be able to think about whether we can do something in a totally different way. If we internalize this hate, this pain, this mistrust, we won't be able to achieve the common wealth of human being to hope. To trust and ultimately to love. Our brighter future starts from a common emotional background, and that ground lies in sharing secrets and stories in your families. Thank you.